Welcome back everybody. In this video we'll discuss the proof of proposition 1.20. Let's jump straight in. So first the question is what's the probability of accepting a sample? And the probability of accepting xn for fixed n is xn is accepted if in our algorithm un is less than or equal to p of xn. This is straight from here. That is how we decide whether we accept or reject. And in this case, let's write that a bit carefully. There are two random quantities. There is first xn, and xn we know has density g. So that here averages with the correct weights of everything xn could do. And then we need to keep track of what un does. So we go from 0 to 1 du, and the weight here is 1 because un is standard uniform distributed. And then we just need to count the cases where un is smaller or equal to pn. So if we want to, we can write that using an indicator function for the event un is less than 2p of xn, which is defined to be 1 if the event is true and 0 otherwise. And here I just see a mistake. Namely, we should have written p of x here because x is what describes our behavior of xn. So x goes over all possible values xn could take with these weights. And then where we need the xn here, we plug in the x. And similarly, here I should have written u, which following the same logic represents the possible values un could take. Let's see how we can simplify this. The first thing is we can work out this inner integral. Namely, we integrate from 0 to 1. And for the first part of the integral, where u is less than p, we integrate 1. And for the second part of the integral where u is bigger than p, we integrate 0. That's how the indicator function does this. So we can read off the value of the integral directly from the picture, namely the area underneath this curve, p times 1 equals p. So that's p of x. So we get integral p of x, g of x, dx. And if we think back about what we did at the beginning of the video, we recognize this integral. Let me just go back. This integral occurred here. So integral p of x, g of x, dx happens to be the constant we call z, which is the normalizing constant for the density f. So this probability equals the integral we just recognized equals z. And that was part of the statement b, where we said each proposal is accepted with probability z that we have just checked. Now that we know the probability of accepting a sample, we need to next tackle the question, what is the distribution of accepted samples? So what we need is the distribution of x and k. And there are various ways to characterize the distribution, and we do the simplest here. Namely, we are going to show the probability of x and k being in a equals integral over a f of x dx. So that's our aim. And once we have shown that by the definition of a density, that shows that f is the density of x and k. Namely, the density is the function you need to integrate over the set to get the probability of the random variable hitting the set, and that's what we have here. So what we need to do is we need to fill in the steps to get from the probability of x and k being in a to that integral. So let's see how we can do that. We will perform that proof in several steps. And the main complication we need to deal with is that here we have two sources of randomness mixed into one expression, namely xn is random for every n. But then also out of the sequence of random x, we pick a random element because nk again is random because this depends on the random accept and reject decisions. So x and k, that has randomness in x and randomness in nk. And the main tool in the proof will be to take these apart by conditioning on what could nk do. Let me do that in steps. So the first step will be to consider the index of the previously accepted sample fix. So I'll condition on nk minus 1 being some known value n. And then we get some answer. And then in the second step, we need to get rid of this condition and work out the unconditioned probability. So let's first this. assume we know the previously accepted sample was at time n. That was accepted. And then there are more times to come and say a few of them are rejected. And then at this unknown time, that is the next accepted one. So that was nk minus 1. And this unknown time, that will be nk. So that's the situation we have. We assume the previously accepted sample was at a fixed and known time n. And now we need to 
consider both the question when is an example accepted and then at this time what does x do. To work out this probability what we are going to do is we are going to take apart the cases of how many steps we need to do until we accept nk. So in the picture I want to call number of steps on between nk minus 1 and nk I want to call that m and that can be any positive integer. So we do sum m from 1 to infinity, that's all possible values. And then this probability x n k in a, I want to consider the special case here that n k equals n plus m, and I still need to copy the condition, so n k minus 1 equals m. That takes apart the event in the first line, that is the same event x n k in a, but then I consider all the cases what nk could have been separately. It's bigger than n, but it could be n plus 1, n plus 2, n plus 3, and so on. And that's disjoint cases, so I can work out the probabilities individually and then just add them up. Now I can, in the first x, change the index to n plus m. I've just changed this because we know here, if we are in this case, nk equals n plus n, so it doesn't matter if I write nk or n plus m, but that solves the problem of the two types of randomness in one expression. Now we have just x with the fixed index, which is the known n plus one of the n's, and that's much easier to deal with. We know how to do that, because x has density g. The other thing we still need to deal with is this event, nk being n plus m, so that means m minus 1 samples got rejected here and the mth sample got accepted. And to work out the probability of this event, we just need to remember how the algorithm worked. So rejected meant u was bigger than p. So for the first one being bigger than p, I can just write u n plus 1 bigger than p x n plus 1 and so on. And the last one we need to reject was n plus m minus 1. So we have u n plus m minus 1 is bigger than probability x n plus m minus 1. Finally, the m's 1 must be accepted because nk equals n plus m. So we know u n plus m is smaller or equal p x n plus m. And this event I still need to condition on nk minus 1 being equal to n because that's what I'm copying from the previous line. Now, to work with this expression, let us first sort the terms by the times which are involved. So the first one is a bit out of place, that belongs to time n plus m, which otherwise we have here. So let me just reorder the terms a bit. So I'll move this down here and this a bit to the left. So now we have everything which relates to time n plus 1 is here, everything which relates to time n plus m minus 1 is here, and the slightly more complicated term here covers everything which relates to time n plus m. And the fact we can now make use of is that different times are independent, so x n plus 1 and u n plus 1 were chosen independently of all other x and all other u. And the probability of several independent events can be written as the product of the individual probabilities. This rule still holds true if we are considering conditional probabilities. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to split that probability into a product of individual probabilities. Let us do that. So we keep the sum. And then the first probability is probability of u n plus 1 greater than p of x n plus 1, conditioned on n k minus 1 equals n. The following ones increase the time up to probability of u n plus m minus 1 greater than p of x n plus m minus 1, still conditioned on n k minus 1 equals m. And the last term corresponding to time n plus m is probability of x n plus m in A and u n plus m less than or equal to p x n plus m and again conditioned on n k minus 1 equals n. The advantage of this is now that we have the product we can consider these terms all individually. Let's start with the first one. So the first term is probability of rejecting sample n plus 1 conditioned on nk minus 1 being equal to little n. And the first thing we see here, 
the event is independent of the condition. Because that something happened at time n, that has nothing to do with what happens at time n plus 1. So the probability of rejecting that will not be influenced by the information nk minus 1 equals little n. So that is just the generic probability of rejecting and we worked that out. That is 1 minus the probability of accepting and accepting we said happens with probability z. So that just equals 1 minus z. The same argument applies to all of the following times. So p u n plus m minus 1 bigger than p x n plus m minus 1 conditioned on n k minus 1 equals n is actually independent of the condition. So it's just the probability of rejecting a sample. So it's 1 minus z. Now the final term is a bit different. Again, we can argue the event is independent of the condition n k minus 1 equals little n. But here we have two different components. So let's see what we can do. So it's probability u n plus m bigger than p x n plus m x n plus m in a. And I write the condition, but we are not going to need it. Let me just cross this out to visually make it clear. We didn't need these conditions. Well, and to do that, we use the strategy we learned at the start of this proof. Namely, we integrate over everything x n plus m could do that had density g. And we integrate over all possible values. Then the other random quantity here is u. So we integrate from 0 to 1 du to cover all possible values of u. And we don't need to wait here because we are uniformly distributed. And then the event we need here is so that's the indicator function of u bigger than p of x and x in a. That's what we get. Now, how can we work this out? So the first observation is these indicator functions we can multiply. That doesn't change the value. So we do integral 0 to 1 indicator function u bigger p of x times indicator function of x in a, du, d of x, dx. And the reason I can multiply these is the first indicator function with the two events, that is one if both of these events are true. This comma here stands for an end. And these individual indicator functions, each of these is one if the corresponding event is true. And for the product to be one, both factors need to be one. So the product is one if both events hold. So there is no change to that. That is numerically the same value. And what we can do is we can move this term which is independent to u outside the u integral. So let's do that. I move that outside the u integral. So that is now in place. And this integral we can evaluate same way we did it last time, namely the function we are integrating equals 1 if u is bigger than p and 0 otherwise. So the integral is the area under the curve. So equals this time 1 minus p, since it's 1 minus p times 1. So I just noticed I made a mistake here. That sign should have been smaller or equal. Then here we had a smaller or equal because at time n plus m we accept instead of reject the sample. So consequently this indicator function has a u smaller or equal p of x and that carries through throughout the calculation. So the plot looks like this and the correct result is actually p. So with this mistake fixed, what we get is that this expression equals integral p of x indicator function x in a g of x dx. And there is one final step we can do, which is more notational, namely this indicator function here inside the set a, we multiply with 1, we just have p times g. But outside the set a, we have the indicator function equal to 0. So p times indicator function times g equals 0, so we're integrating 0. And integrating 0 does not contribute, so what we can do is we can just restrict the integral to the set a instead of the whole real line and integrate p of x, g of x, dx. Now that gives us the final term here. And now the last remaining step is just to put that all together. So let me make a copy of that. The sum stays, sum m equals 1 to infinity. Then the first probabilities, we argued that each of them equals 1 minus z. So we have 1 minus z times 1 minus z. And the last term we argued equals the integral of p of x, g of x over the set a. So I write integral over the set a, p 
of x, g of x, dx. And these terms, now we need to be careful with the dots. There is one for each time from n plus 1 up to n plus m minus 1. So there are m minus 1 terms. This we can write as a power. Let's do that. So we get some m from 1 to infinity, 1 minus z to the m minus 1 times integral over a p of x, g of x, dx. And now there is another thing we notice, namely technically that integral is inside the sum, but since it doesn't depend on m, we can treat it as a constant factor and we can take it outside the sum. And now there comes one final step, namely we need to evaluate this infinite sum, but thankfully that is a geometric series we know from analysis. So what I'll do is I'll first shift the index by one. So we have m ranging from 1 to infinity, but then the exponent is m minus 1. So what we can do is instead we can have the index start at 0, and instead we take the exponent m, that will give the same result. And then we remember from analysis, geometric series is 1 over 1 minus the number, and here the number is 1 minus z, so we get 1 over 1 minus 1 minus z, which equals 1 over z. And this gives the result, let me just write it, that is integral a 1 over z p of x g of x dx, and if we check 1 over z p of x g of x equals f, so we get integral a f of x dx, and that is what we want to obtain for the unconditioned probability, so that is certainly a step in the correct direction. How do we get rid of this condition? It turns out that is rather easy, namely we don't need to do anything, we just see whatever nk minus 1 equals, in any case the result is this, which does not depend on n, and since the answer doesn't depend on n, that will be also equal to the unconditioned probability. So we can conclude probability of x n k in a without the condition also equals integral over a f of x dx, and from that we can conclude x n k has density f. Great, and that is really the core of the proof. There are a few loose ends to wrap up, but I will leave these for you to read in the box. So that's what you should now do. You should first maybe rewatch the video. I appreciate that is one of the most complicated proofs in the book. But once you have understood my explanations in the videos, go to the book, page 16 and 17 and 18, and read the proof of Proposition 1.20 there to get all the missing details.